Good morning, everybody. It is 7 o'clock. You are very welcome to join us on The Breakfast Show here on Sky News. An exclusive report this morning on alleged ammunition for Russia's war in Ukraine. A security source tells us about the ships from Iran carrying bullets and shells to Russia. We'll speak to Ukraine's um, ambassador also this morning. The UN Refugee Agency says it's profoundly concerned about the government's new laws to crack down on small boats. Migration will be joined by the Home Secretary, Suella Braverman, and her Labour shadow, Yvette Cooper. It's Wednesday, the 8th of March. Sky News learns Iran has secretly supplied a large quantities of ammunition to Russia for the war in Ukraine. We track the ships accused of replenishing Moscow's stocks. And the PM insists that the new laws to stop migrants crossing the channel are tough but fair. But the UN Refugee Agency claims it's effectively a ban on asylum. A warning of severe disruption this morning with more snow and ice expected as the UK is hit by an Arctic blast. Hope of a rail strike breakthrough. The RMT union suspends industrial action against Network Rail after a new pay offer. The NHS approves a new weight loss injection which can help people reduce their weight by 10%. The legacy of the lionesses on International Women's Day. The government makes good on promises made to the Euro 22 winners for equal access to school sports. Hello, everybody. A very good morning to you. We uh, want to start with uh, an exclusive report. Uh, a security source has told Sky News that Iran has secretly supplied large quantities of bullets, rockets and mortar shells to Russia for the war in Ukraine and plans to send still more. The source said two Russian-flagged cargo ships departed an Iranian port in January bound for Russia via the Caspian Sea, carrying about 100 million bullets and around 300,000 shells. We want to get more information on that. Uh, it's an exclusive by our Defence and Security Editor, Deborah Haynes. Good morning. It's good, good to morning. see you this morning. Tell me more. Yes, yeah, so this source told me about these um, alleged shipments by Iran to Russia, that Russia paid for these ammunition rounds in cash, um, that it used, uh, it, it comprised a whole range of different types of bullets, different sizes for, um, from, for pistols and assault rifles, machine guns, to mortars, grenade launchers, rocket launchers, the full panoply. Um, it's important to say that we haven't had a response from the Russian government nor from the Iranians, but I was speaking to the Ukrainian ambassador yesterday. He said he's not surprised by these claims. He says he expects more because Russia is having to use up so much of its ammunition in this war in Ukraine, which is going on. Russia's defence industry is being hit by Western sanctions, making it harder to produce more, which is why it's turning to these allies. And I know you have a special report, especially for breakfast. Here we go. Russia is burning through ammunition in Ukraine. It means Russian industry is under pressure to produce more. Now, claims have emerged that Moscow is also receiving help from a close ally. A source alleges that two ships transported a large amount of ammunition in January from Iran to Russia, paid for in cash. The security source told me the two ships are thought to have been carrying up to 100 million bullets and around 300,000 shells of varying sizes for different weapons like machine guns, grenade launchers, mortars. It's not been possible independently to verify the volume and one expert said it did sound quite high, but Iran is certainly suspected of supplying an amount of ammunition to Russia to help replenish stockpiles that are thought to be running low. Sky News's data and forensics unit looked into the movement of the two Russian ships that were named by the source as the Musa Jalil and the Begay. On the 9th of January, marine traffic data show them in the Iranian port of Amirabad on the Caspian Sea. This satellite image is taken the following day. One of the ships, the Musa Jalil, seen here, is likely turning to leave the port. 
Later, the other ship, Bege, and now Musa Jalil, appear to have left and are travelling north towards the Russian coast. By the 27th of January, they've reached the Russian port of Astrakhan. The vessels can be seen here and here in this satellite image taken on the 2nd of February. Sky News hasn't been able independently to verify what they were carrying. Ukraine's ambassador to the UK says he's not surprised about the ammunition claims, given that Iran is already supplying Russia with deadly drones. This is a sort of coalition of, of the weak nations trying to, you know, to consolidate their last efforts to withstand the pressure of much bigger Western support, which the Ukraine is, is, is quite happy to have. But President Vladimir Putin is still talking tough as his military fights on. Asked about the ammunition claims, Russia's defence ministry and Iran's foreign ministry have yet to give a response. I suppose the big question, Deborah, is what does this then mean going forward as far as China is concerned? That's the question that many Western cap capitals are asking and are looking at. The US has come out publicly and declassified intelligence saying that they believe China is considering sending weapons to Russia for its war in Ukraine. Um, there's been no confirmation that that's happened. Beijing has denied these claims. But I was talking to officials about this in recent days, and they see this as potentially, this would be potentially game changing should it happen, given that sustaining the war effort is so key. The, the Western allies are having to struggle and scramble to keep uh, replenishing the Ukrainian stocks. The same is true for Russia. At the moment, uh, the stocks are running low, but if China steps in with its huge military arsenal, um, that, that could be decisive, potentially, okay. and it's why people are trying to stop that from happening. OK, we've got the Ukrainian ambassador on the programme later on this morning. For now, thanks very much indeed. Thank you. Well, the Kremlin is this morning questioning a report that US intelligence believe a pro-Ukraine group was behind the attack on the Nord Stream gas pipelines. You remember back in September, the undersea explosion seven months into the Ukraine war, ruptured pipelines running from Russia and Germany. The New York Times says US officials believe the pro-Ukraine group acted without the involvement of Ukraine's government. A Kremlin spokesperson says America can't assume anything without proper investigation. And as I said, at 9.30, we'll be joined by Ukraine's ambassador to the UK, Vadim Prostyko. In other news, the Prime Minister will face MPs for the first time today after setting out plans for a new law to try to tackle small boat crossings in the Channel. The new legislation has been widely criticised, both at home and indeed overseas, with the UN Refugee Agency saying it's profoundly concerned. Let's take a look at the illegal, as it's described, migration bill in a bit more detail. It would legislate a legal duty for the Home Secretary to remove anyone entering the UK Illegally, the bill allows the detention of illegal arrivals without judicial review for 28 days or until they can be removed. In 2021, the UK had just over 2,500 detention places. That's at current levels of migration, less than 20% of the capacity needed. Migrants won't be able to use modern slavery laws to stop their removal. Any uh, challenges will only be heard after... They have left the UK. The Home Secretary told MPs she would not yet address the full legal complexities of the bill. An annual cap on the number of refugees being accepted by the UK will be decided by MPs in Westminster. Migrants arriving by illegal routes risk a permanent ban on settlement, citizenship and re-entry to the UK. Well, Shaman is standing by for us in Dover this morning. So we chatted yesterday morning. We have a clearer idea of what the government is planning this morning, don't we? Good morning to you. Yes, we have a much clearer idea of, of what the government is planning, but not much detail on how it will be implemented. However, the government says that these tough, this tough new law is needed to clamp down on those using the small boats crossing. So this is, of course, because there's been a huge increase in the amount of people that use this way of accessing uh, the country. It's gone from th around 300 in 2018 to 45,000 as of last 
last year and this is why the government says they are introducing this. They say they've tried everything else and it hasn't worked. However, the opposition, the Labour Party, have actually blamed the government. They've accused the government of trying to blame others over the illegal immigration issue, saying that it's actually the government that have allowed the criminal gangs to take hold of the channel and the border. And the UN, they've also uh, backed up this, uh, this concern as well. They've said that they are cons uh, profoundly concerned by the plans and it would effectively amount to a ban on asylum. They've said uh, the current legislation, which was obviously introduced yesterday or was announced yesterday, would eradicate the right for those to seek refuge and protection in the UK. As I say, the government says that in order for them to be able to put these safe and legal routes in place, they first need to crack down on these small boats crossings and the illegal gangs that often prey on the people trying to come over here. So it, indeed, there will be lots of questions for Rishi Sunak to answer later today in the Commons. OK, for now, thank you. And in just a few moments' time, joined by the uh, woman of the moment, the Home Secretary, Suella Braverman. Um, that coming up at 20 past seven. Uh, before that, we want to hear from you this morning. Labour says the government is breaking the law in order to stop people seeking asylum here in the UK. What do you think? You can tweet me directly if you would like to, at Kay Burley. So, basically... Labour says that the government is breaking the law in order to get this through Parliament. What do you think? Do you think that the government should be in a position to be able to stretch the law to its boundaries in order to make sure that migrants cannot come to the UK and if they do, they will be sent back straight away? Or do you feel that we should have more compassion as a nation? Your thoughts, love to hear from you, at Kay Burley. Um, and we will share your thoughts with the world a little bit later on. An Arctic blast is intensifying, bringing sleet and snow across England and Wales and snow and hail showers to Scotland. A number of national severe warnings for snow and ice have been issued. And the Met Office says northern rural communities are likely to be cut off over the next day or two. Uh, our weather presenter, Kirsty McCabe, is uh, joining us now from snowy Surrey. It certainly is. Good morning, Kirsty. <laughs> Good morning, Kay. Yes, we've not had much snow in Surrey this winter, but we've got some right now. And across many parts of southern England, parts of Wales, southern Ireland as well, waking up to quite an awkward wintry mix of rain, sleet and snow. So near the coast, it's pretty much rain. Head inland and head to higher elevation, then you're going to see snow. And that's the problem in this country, of course, is that we really have such a fine boundary between whether we get rain or snow as temperatures hover around that freezing point. So for some, it's not looking great this morning. Although it's quite pretty to look at the snow, it does cause lots of problems on the roads, the rails, and for some schools shutting as well across northern Scotland. There are a few areas that have had issues with snow already this week, but this slushy mix of ice and snow on the roads could make some quite tricky travelling conditions this morning. It will melt through the day, of course, as temperatures rise, but freeze again tonight. So there's a myriad of weather warnings out there. Throughout the next few days, we'll continue to see quite frequent snow and hail showers affecting northern Scotland, but elsewhere it's a bit more interesting. Today we've got this mix of rain, sleet and snow across southern parts of the UK and Ireland. That's moving its way east eastwards by around lunchtime and then another pulse comes in from the west for this afternoon this evening and then more rain, sleet and snow moving northwards through Thursday. So we'll all see some wintry weather through the next few days. OK, lovely. Thank you. Looking at those pictures from Scotland, I'm sure that's where they filmed one of the Bond movies. I'm sure it is. People in Scotland watching this morning, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, be good to hear from you as always. Meantime, the RMT union has suspended all industrial action at Network Rail following a new pay offer. Industrial action was due to take place next Thursday, but the walkout has been called off. Although strikes by workers at 14 train operators are still scheduled to go ahead. Sky News understands talks are ongoing between the unions and the health secretary and will continue today. Nurses and other health professionals had been striking over pay and working conditions. The sister of one of the Cardiff car crash victims says she was disappointed with the police response to the incident, saying detectives should have acted straight away when they were reported missing over the weekend. Sorry. Yesterday, a vigil was held in Cardiff to remember the three young victims. Fireworks were led off to pay tribute while crowds of people gathered with balloons, flowers and messages of condolence. 
Eve Smith, Darcy Ross and Raphael Jean died in the crash, while Sophie Rousson and Shane Lachlan are in hospital with critical injuries. An investigation has been launched into two police forces over claims they failed to begin a search for the victims quickly enough. They'd been reported missing when they disappeared after a night out on Saturday. Now, it's the second day of the parole hearing for Britain's most notorious prisoner, Charles Bronson. It's expected to start with evidence from an independent psychologist commissioned by Bronson's legal team. During the first day of the hearing on Monday, he told the board he was almost an angel now compared with his old self. The 70-year-old spent nearly five decades in prison and says he wants to get out to see his 95-year-old mum. The trial of the man accused of shooting dead Olivia Pratt called Bell in Liverpool last summer continues this morning. Yesterday, prosecutors told the court the nine-year-old screamed, Mum, I'm scared, moments before a bullet struck her chest. Olivia was killed last August as a gunman chased a convicted burglar into her home. Her mother, Cheryl, was injured in the shooting. A statement was read in court on behalf of Cheryl Corbell. It reads... I was just screaming to go away and then I heard the gunshot and realised, because I felt it, it hit my hand. She referred to Olivia as the baby and said, I remember when I turned around and realised the baby was right behind me because she'd come, obviously, come down the stairs because she'd heard. One of the other children heard Cheryl scream, Olivia had been hit. On the stairs, she told Olivia, stay with me, baby. In other news, the Match of the Day host, Gary Lineker, will be spoken to by the BBC after appearing to compare the government's asylum policy to Nazi Germany. Writing on Twitter, the ex-footballer criticised the bill as immeasurably cruel and said the language in which the plans had been set out was not dissimilar to that used by Germany in the 1930s. Sir Graham Brady has become the latest prominent Conservative MP to announce he won't be standing at the next general election. He's best known as the long-time chair of the 1922 Backbench Committee, which has been central to the ousting of the last three Prime Ministers. At least six Palestinians have been killed and dozens more have been injured in an Israeli army raid in the occupied West Bank city of Jenin. The military said that one of those killed in the Jenin refugee camp was the suspected assailant behind a fatal shooting of two brothers in the northern uh, West Bank town of Hawari last week. Studies have found that the jab um, for weight loss um, saw people's weight drop by 12% on average, after 68 weeks. I'm going to tell you more about what we're talking about with that. Basically, it's an injection that you can have, which may well be available on the National Health Service, and it means that you can lose up to 12% of your body weight. OK, let's uh, bring uh, more details now, should we, about the small boats that we have been talking about. Lucky to have the Home Secretary in the studio for us this morning. Good morning to you. Thank morning, you so Kate. much for joining us. Um, as a barrister, are you completely comfortable with breaking the law? We're not breaking the law, Kay. Uh, uh, we are very confident that our measures that we've announced yesterday are in compliance with our international law obligations. Uh, but it's really important to know that we need to take action. The status quo is unacceptable. Uh, 45,000 people arrived here illegally, sometimes fatally, so last year, wasn't on small illegal. boats. It wasn't illegal. It, it's breaking our laws to come here without a legal basis, without permission, and passing through a safe country where they should have and could have claimed asylum first. Let me tell first. you what Amnesty International say. They say the rights of migrants, refugees and asylum seekers are protected by international law, regardless of how and why they arrive in a country. They have the same rights as everyone else, plus special or specific protections. Um, as a barrister, you're condoning breaking the law, according to Amnesty International. We're not breaking the law, and... Uh, no government representative has said that we're breaking the law. In fact, we've made it very clear that we believe we're in compliance with all of our international obligations. For example, the Refugee Convention, the European Convention on Human Rights, uh, other, other uh, conventions to which we are subject. But what's important is that we do need to take uh, compassionate 
but necessary and fair measures now because there are people who are dying to try and get here. They are breaking our laws. They are abusing the generosity of the British people. Not, and we now like need to ensure boat. that they are deterred from doing that. We need to break the model of the people smuggling gangs. We need to stop people making this journey in the first place. If they want to come to the United Kingdom, they should choose to come here through safe and legal routes. They should put in an application the through the legal They're not mechanisms breaking the law, that Home we Secretary. have offered them. They're not breaking the law. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights, you just quoted that, it states that everyone has the <coughs> right to seek and enjoy asylum from persecution in other countries. That's what they're doing. Well, we, we have a very generous regime of supporting people coming here lawfully for humanitarian protection, whether it's the 150,000 Ukrainians, whether it's the 100,000 people from Hong Kong, Afghanistan, Syria. In many instances, we accept people who have come here lawfully for those very purposes that you've just referred to. What we can't go on accepting is people breaking our laws, jumping the queue. The I I'm afraid you're wrong. They are, are coming here the law, unlawfully then? because they are uh, they don't have a legal basis to be here. We're going to be changing the law to ensure that they don't make the journey in the first place. If they come here illegally, they come here on a small boat without a legal basis to be here, having passed through a safe country through which they should, in which they should have first claimed asylum, they won't be able to settle here. They won't be able to claim asylum here. Either, they won't yeah. have an entitlement to a life in the UK. You have talked about stretching the absolute boundaries, haven't you, of, of what is and isn't legal. That's like being a bit pregnant. You're either breaking the law or you're not. Um, and uh, according to all of the research that we have done, people who get on a small boat to ride to the UK are not breaking the law. It's those that smuggle them here that are breaking the law. What are you doing about them? Well, on that last point, we can definitely agree. Uh, I, I won't sure repeat can, the, the we'll first try. point. The people smuggling gangs are a root cause of this problem. And they are sophisticated, they are operating on an international scale, they are well resourced, and they are exploiting people. Uh, they are selling a lie. They are encouraging people to pay sometimes tens of thousands of pounds, sometimes their life savings, in the vain hope that they're going we to travel here in a boat and get a life in the UK. That must be smashed. That model must so what be are you broken. Doing? Uh, well, we are doing extensive work with the National Crime Agency uh, to smash these gangs. And that's why I'm very pleased that we've had hundreds of uh, arrests and convictions. We've had uh, several uh, uh, gangs which have been shut down. I went out with the National Crime Agency a few months ago where they were actually able to arrest uh, very early in the morning uh, a, a people smuggler who had been 000, part of yeah, but this, these gangs. people came across on the boats last year, so it's not very effective, <clears throat> isn't it? Is it? And we spoke to a, a smuggler here on Sky News, as you know, who said that three quarters of the smugglers are based here in the UK. Well, you're absolutely right that it's not acceptable that these gangs proliferate and continue to operate in okay. the way that they do. That's why we're also working with the French to intercept the, uh, the departures, to share intelligence, to prevent the, uh, the successful operation by these criminal enterprises. Not that effective at the moment, but let's see, we've only had That's a finite amount of time. That's why we need to take these measures. Yeah. When will the new detention centres be open for business? Well, we already have um, a detention the new estate. Ones. When will they be open for business? We are uh, we are on the point. We are rolling out new detention spaces to support when the detention pressures. Business? I'm not going to give precise dates because uh, we will have uh, you know we've got uh, logistical uh, challenges that we're always overcoming. But very very soon we'll be expanding our detention capacity to meet the uh, the the need uh, brought about by okay. our measures. Okay. When will the first failed asylum seekers be deported? Again, I can't give you precise dates, I'm afraid. Okay. We have uh, lots of Do you have processes which are in train. Uh, the, uh, the processing of these people? Well, we have, uh, well, you, I mean, we already have uh, an asylum caseload which is being which worked is through. Which is very effective. Well, we're doubling um, the number of caseworkers 
to over 2,000, uh, uh, by over 2,000, uh, to process the asylum decisions which are waiting uh, within the Home Office. 160,000 people, are, are, uh, there's a backlog of 160,000 people, and yet you still think that you can process people within 28 days? Well, that is exactly why we've got to introduce the measures, and some of our measures will put strict time limits on the, uh, uh, on the time within which people but can make their legal that, claims. And we will be employing How many more, more staff. More staff. Are you going to employ? We are employing more staff already. We're doubling the number of asylum caseworkers already to bear down on our asylum backlog, and we're making good progress in that respect. We're increasing our productivity, we're streamlining our process. It's absolutely vital that we bear down on that 100,000 uh, cases you can't tell that me are waiting first... for a decision. People We've now introduced new measures and new procedures. They are going to be... Uh, it, it will all depend on when this bill becomes an act of Parliament. When will We've now introduced it. Rwanda? We're going to go through the process in Parliament. I encourage all of my colleagues to support to Rwanda, this bill yeah. so that we get these powers on the statute book as quickly when as possible. When will people be sent to Rwanda? Well, again... We are now, we are, uh, part of our Rwanda scheme is in court. We had a very strong victory in the High Court at the end of last when year. people be sent? Testing the lawfulness of our Rwanda scheme. I should just say, you know, when, about when 12 months people ago, people were deriding our Rwanda scheme as being unlawful. Nobody's The been, High nobody's Court been disagreed with that. Yeah, and we have to uh, respect... So when will they be sent? We have to respect the court timetables. So when will they be sent to Rwanda? Where we, we will be going into an appeal hearing in April relating to the Rwanda scheme. We will then await a judgment from the Court of Appeal. You'd have to ask the, the judiciary as to when the timetable would How be, but we will, will respect cost? any timetable set by the court. How much will it cost per removal? Well, we have uh, paid a sum. We, we, I'm very proud. Not just to Rwanda, uh, but more generally, how much will it cost per removal? Well, at the moment, it's costing £6 million a day how much will it to cost support the asylum seekers who are being housed in hotel accommodation. And the premise of your question is that this is somehow going to cost more. No, no, I completely reject much, that. And I'm, what I'm that's saying not is, sure. I'm we're going to save. You. I'm, I'm looking for some facts, and yeah. I haven't got a lot. How much will it cost for? Well, I'll tell you what we'll save. We'll save three billion pounds a year if we get this uh, bill onto the statute books, if we're able to relocate people to Rwanda and if we're able to stop the boats. OK, let me tell you that Mo Farah was trafficked when he was nine. You probably know this. He's won a six gold Olympic medals. Um, under your new scheme, he would have been deported when he was 18. Is that the case? Well, as I said, we, uh, we are very proud of our world-leading modern slavery uh, is that, and is that uh, the case? regime. Just Let me just answer your question. Please. And we've got uh, world-leading protections on human trafficking. We're signatories to the European Convention Against Trafficking. And I'm very proud of the legislation that this government or the Conservative government put in place to protect victims of trafficking and modern slavery. Uh, that, that, those arrangements are in place and people who are genuine victims of trafficking or modern slavery can claim protection in the UK. Many thousands do you of them do. What we don't want is the illegitimate and I'm going to have to let you go. I know I'm out of time, but do you acknowledge that Mo Farah, a nine-year-old Mo Farah, would have been booted out of the country when he was 18? No, I don't acknowledge that. Mm. I think we have very lawful roots for people who are genuine victims of trafficking or modern slavery and for them to access protection. I'm very proud of that tradition and that culture uh, and that provision in this country. Long may that continue. What we've got to stop is the abuse of our generosity. OK, and just to underline, you're not sure at this stage when the first person will be uh, told that they will be taken out of the country under your new laws. Our new laws are going to make sure that we'll have the power to but you detain and remove people uh, and we're very confident about moving forward with our groundbreaking partnership with Rwanda. I must let you go. It's good of you to join us this morning. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Kay. Thank you. Quick look at uh, what the papers are saying in just a moment, but I do want to tell you that uh, Mark Voyager, a former advisor to the Commanding General of US Army Europe, about our exclusive report on Iran, allegedly supplying ammunition to Russia, will be joining us. Uh, we'll also be speaking to a woman who was misdiagnosed with endometriosis for over a decade as scientists launched a clinical trial for a potential new treatment. Um, and that will be coming up uh, momentarily. Before that, the weather. Warm memories wherever you go. To fly, to fly, the weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. Northerly flow making it very cold, widespread overnight frost, milder air preceded by snow and rain. To fly, the weather, 
Sponsored by Qatar Airways. Time now for a look through some of the photos that have caught our eye today. Contestants for this year's Crufts competition have arrived in Birmingham ahead of day one of the event, which kicks off tomorrow. The annual International Dog Show is the largest of its kind in the world and sees pups from all over compete for various awards, for the top prize being Best in Show. Some of the pooches met up yesterday for a photo call ahead <laughs> of the competition. Uh, this is Harlequin called H for short, and that is a chihuahua called Boo, which is me, and which is the Home Secretary, some might ask. Um, in addition uh, to that, we've got... Do you remember we had three doggies on the programme uh, earlier on in the month? In fact, uh, at the end of last month, they will also be uh, at Cross. I love that picture. Also on the programme for you, still to come, the Lionesses helped to secure the legacy by equaling access to sport in the school. Now then, let's tell you more about the Lionesses. Talked about them before the break. They've helped to secure their legacy by equaling access to sport in school. To mark International Women's Day, the government has announced a new package of measures to ensure boys and girls have equal access to two hours a week of school, uh, sport in school. It comes after England's Lionesses squad launched a campaign urging the government to pass measures to ensure that all girls get the chance to play football at school following their Euros win last summer. Good for them. Looking at our top stories for you this morning, now Sky News has learned that Iran has secretly supplied, supplied, forgive me, large quantities of ammunition to Russia for the war in Ukraine. We track the chips accused of replenishing Moscow's stocks. The Prime Minister says he's up for the fight against critics of new legislation to stop migrant crossings, as the UN Refugee Agency calls it a clear breach of international law. We just had the Home Secretary on the programme and she disagrees. Um, the weather is pretty bad as well, as you can see. Tamara is uh, joining us uh, this morning. Oh, actually, should we hear what uh, the Suella Braverman had to say, first of all, Tamara, and then we will uh, come back to you. I asked her whether she's comfortable that she's not breaking the law with new government plans to tackle illegal migration, as she put it. We're not breaking the law, and uh, no government representative has said that we're breaking the law. In fact, we've made it very clear that we believe we're in compliance with all of our international obligations. For example, the Refugee Convention, the European Convention on Human Rights, uh, other, other uh, conventions to which we are subject. But what's important is that we do need to take uh, compassionate but necessary and fair measures now, because there are people who are dying to try and get here. They are breaking our laws. They are abusing the generosity of the British people. As I said, Tamara's here. The UN and Amnesty International disagree. They say that she is breaking the law. And indeed, few people in government wouldn't concede that there are going to be big legal and practical obstacles to bringing in this bill. In fact, just looking at the bill that the Home Secretary introduced to Parliament yesterday, it says on the front page of it that she's unable to say that this is compatible with the European Convention on Human Rights. Normally, the government would say which bits of international law um, is affected by the laws they're passing. She says she's unable to say that because um, then the government aren't 100% sure whether it is compatible with international law. But she, she's, she's very full on this. Very much so. And the Prime Minister yesterday, when asked, said that effectively that the government would try very hard to defend it in court. I wonder if that will make uh, some MPs and peers in the House of Lords, where this is likely to be held up, a bit jittery about it, the fact that the government has not made sure this is 100% compatible with international law. They clearly are prepared to go and fight it out in the courts. Another big question is, of course, how this is going to work on the ground, because the suggestion is that people who come via the channel with within, will, within 28 days, be uh, sent back to either Rwanda, if they can get that up and running, or their own country or another safe country. Um, there are thousands of people coming 
every day and currently there isn't the detention capacity uh, as you also asked the Home Secretary about and also um, the suggestion that only children under 18 and the most vulnerable people will be able to stay uh, may not be um, something that is going to work legally because of course um, you pointed out the case of Mo Farah and the Home Secretary said he would have protection under our trafficking and modern slavery laws when actually the Prime Minister said yesterday he hoped to stop people claiming under those. Uh, indeed so. The questions I suppose that we wanted to know the answer to would have included um, how much is it going to cost? When are the first people going to go? When will they be going to Rwanda? Um, and we didn't seem to get any answers to any of those. Few answers on any of those. Conservative MPs have been asking those kind of questions as well. I don't think there's much doubt this is going to... Uh, meantime, Sky News has been told that Iran has supplied large quantities of ammunition and military equipment to Russia for its war in Ukraine. A security source says two Russian flagships left... Well, good morning, Kay. Um, thank you for having me. Always a pleasure. Uh, what has transpired, what has been revealed uh, recently, uh, clearly demonstrates that both um, Iran and Russia have uh, entered um, a sort of a uh, de facto alliance, and I would call it an unholy league of undemocratic uh, uh, regimes. Um, that uh, are quite similar in their uh, international actions, uh, also in the way they operate in their region regions and the way they treat their people. Uh, and, and at the uh, diplomatic level, they are effectively considered uh, uh, you know, uh, regimes, have... especially by the West. Uh, regionally, yeah, but... their neighbors are very resentful and afraid. And ultimately, okay, domestically, they feel insecure. technical issues. I'm so, so sorry, uh, uh, Mr. Voyager. We, we're not really able to catch a lot of what you're saying at the moment. We're going to re-establish communication with you and come back to you very shortly indeed. I'm, my apologies for that. Meantime, in other news, the number of people using illegal cannabis to self-medicate has increased by almost 30% since 2019, according to new research. It was legalised for medical purposes five years ago, but people living in the UK continue to use the illegal cannabis uh, to gain access to the drug, the market, that is. Alice spoke to one medicinal cannabis user and sent this report. Um, dried leaf is put into the top here. Shut like that, switch it on. And when it comes to temperature, then I simply am ready to inhale from here. For over three decades, Chris Cowan took cannabis illegally to manage his depression and PTSD. I mean, really, it's potluck with the type of cannabis that you get when you're buying illicit cannabis. Um, you don't know the quality or the strength of it, so there would be times where I would take the illicit cannabis and it would actually exacerbate my symptoms. Chris is now one of the 32,000 people in the UK who take medical cannabis. For a prescription, patients have to receive a medical diagnosis and show evidence that they've tried other treatments. The difference is, is, is huge. It's still the same plant, but it's very, very different to the illicit cannabis that you get. The first thing that I noticed is that it alleviates my symptoms right away. It doesn't get me high, it doesn't intoxicate me. In fact, it does the opposite. Research commissioned by Sapphire Medical Clinics, who specialise in cannabis much. treatments, suggest a quarter of the public are unaware that medical cannabis can be prescribed. 1.8 million people are treating themselves for a medically diagnosed condition with cannabis uh, on the illicit market. Um, I think that's the, just the figure itself is something that took uh, us by surprise when we saw it. GPs can't prescribe medical cannabis. They need to make a referral. But some are unconvinced that it can treat such wide-ranging conditions. It appears to work for those with intractable epilepsy, and it also appears to work for certain conditions in multiple, multiple sclerosis. But Cannabis is now being proposed for a whole host of other conditions from pain to anxiety to depression. So the main problem is that we need to get a research base. While medical cannabis may continue to be controversial, for patients like Chris, it's life-changing. Alice Porter, Sky News. Check this out, video emerging of a passenger on a United Airlines flight threatening to kill every man on this plane before attacking a flight attendant. What's all that about? The man tried to stab a flight attendant with a broken metal spoon on a flight from Los Angeles to Boston. Before that, he attempted to open the plane's emergency door. The 33-year-old was arrested when the plane landed in Boston. United Airlines said no one was injured in the incident. 
want to tell you about a new study now which has found one in ten women with endometriosis suffer in silence. March is dedicated to endometriosis awareness, a condition where tissue, similar to the lining of the womb, uh, grows in places it shouldn't, causing excruciating pain and, in some cases, infertility. Scientists are now launching a clinical trial that, if successful, could provide the first new treatment for the condition in 40 years. Let's get more about this, should we? Former model and founder of the Endometriosis Foundation, Carla Cressy is with us. Hi, Carla. It's great to see you. Thanks for joining us. Tell me about endometriosis. So it is probably one of the most under-recognised, most misunderstood, underdiagnosed conditions. And as you said, it affects one in ten, often in silence. Um, I was diagnosed when I was 25. But my symptoms started when I was 13. I was already under gynaecology at 14, but nobody knew, you know, what was wrong or could kind of piece together why, why this was happening. Um, so I went through this kind of 10-year back and forth to the GP, to hospital, um, and my diagnosis really only came around because I was... Um, it was suspected that I had acute appendicitis, so I had my appendix removed. And we realised it wasn't that. I was still really unwell. Um, and then I was kind of taken back into surgery and had open surgery, uh, where they found stage four, which is the very end stage of endometriosis, and it had spread to my kind of bladder, my bowel. Um, so, yeah, it's been quite a long kind of journey to get to my diagnosis. Um, and back then, endometriosis was nowhere to be seen on the internet, so there was no kind of information or awareness um, as to what there is now. But it's still just lacking so much. Um, so what sort of symptoms should young women uh, watching this morning, what should they be looking out for? Pelvic pain, painful periods, kind of maybe changes in menstrual flow. It can be so different for each person. Mm. Um, painful bladder and bowel movements, painful sex, and also difficulties getting pregnant. Um, but also it can depend where it is in the body, because it can really travel anywhere in the body, um, to the type of symptoms that you might have. So. For example, if it's affecting the bladder, you might experience, um, you know, extreme pain passing bladder movements or unable to empty the bladder. Um, so, yeah, it really can just depend on where, where it is. And it's very debilitating, I'm guessing. Absolutely. Do yeah. you... When you went to the GP, they didn't know what was going on for a they long time. They didn't know. So, what, if other women go to the GP, what do they need to say in order to try to, to think, this might be endometriosis and you need to test for this? Well, keeping a record of symptoms can be really helpful. Um, just having something on paper and also reaching out to community support groups and kind of speaking to others going through it as well, because we are all so different. Um, and chances are you will come across somebody else who's going through it very similar to you. Um, and just writing down questions, asking questions, referring to the NICE guidelines, which I believe are in review at the moment. Um, and, you know, just going on that referral pathway and just How making sure that... it? One in ten. But I... Personally, I think it's a lot more because so many people find it so difficult to get diagnosed. Um, so, I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if it was at least one in six, one in seven. Right, that's a lot of women, mm. isn't it? And, it? and it could affect your fertility? Yes. So, for me, I was diagnosed with stage four, but it had progressed to frozen pelvis disease. So my, but I also had ovarian endometriosis as well, so I would have these quite large ovarian cysts. Um, which is where the endometriosis grows in the ovaries, and my ovarian function was incredibly low. I was kind of going into this natural menopause at 27, um, and my fallopian tubes, I think one was detached, and they were just pulled and just in ruins, basically. So I, I had my infertility diagnosis at 27. Goodness. And when you look back at that time, what, what, what do you think? I mean, we just saw some pictures of you there, obviously, mm. in a hospital gown. It was a difficult time. Yeah, I just wish... You know, if, if I had seen just a, a poster in a doctor's surgery or, you know, a list of these symptoms... I mean, when I was Googling my symptoms all those years ago, they were kind of linking to cervical cancer, you know, the irregular periods, pelvic pain, pain during sex. And I remember I was going to my GP and I said, you know, this isn't right, I have all these symptoms, but because of my age, I, I was just repeatedly denied smear tests. So, you know, it can cause a lot of stress if you're not aware of endometriosis, which is why I'm incredibly grateful to work with such a big brand like Holland & Barrett, who kind of put my story out on their uh, digital screens with their uh, women's wellness brand, Parlour, to just bring that to the high street. Because if I'd seen that, I mean, 
you would have said, Absolutely, oh, that's me, really, that's me. Yeah. And there are new drugs trials, not that you, you know, that's particularly your area of expertise, but what you can talk to us about is the impact that it has on young women when they don't know what's happening to their bodies and other people don't seem to know either. Um, we've got better? Mm, not particularly. I mean, I think... I see it every day because, you know, through social media and things, I follow a lot of people around endometriosis, but there's still a lot of people that haven't heard of it or, you know, don't know the symptoms. I'll go for lunch with a group of women who I may have never met before and a lot of them, well, what is that? You know, and it's, it's difficult. I mean, I remember just two or three years ago, I was going to the hospital with these endometriosis flare-ups, which were so debilitating, I was having to go to hospital. And I'd come across different doctors who would say, I'm sorry, I don't really know much about this. Goodness. Mm. Well, hopefully these new drug trials will help in, in the path to discovering more about endometriosis so other young women don't have to go through what you did. It's great to talk to you. Thank, Thank you. you for talking to us this morning. Much appreciated. Thank you. Um, apparently it's going to snow today. Quick look at the weather. Warm memories wherever you go. To fly, to fly, the weather. To fly. Sponsored by Qatar Airways. Northerly flow making it very cold with widespread overnight frost. Mild air preceded by snow and rain will spread from the south later this week. Looking out the window, it's snowing a little tiny bit here in London. The weather. Sponsored by Qatar Airways. Oh, check this out. These guys, these little guys, are not just bumbling around. Scientists have discovered that bees can learn to solve puzzles by watching more experienced peers. These bees train to open a puzzle box containing sugar, who then pass this knowledge on to the rest of their colony. It must mean that they are the bees knees. Or the bees nest. I think bees knees is better. What do you think? Um, before the break, we were talking uh, to the Home Secretary, Suella Braverman. She told me about the government's new legislation to tackle small boats migration. We're not breaking the law and uh, no government representative has said that we're breaking the law. In fact, we've made it very clear that we believe we're in compliance with all of our international obligations. For example, the Refugee Convention, the European Convention on Human Rights, uh, other, other uh, conventions to which we are subject. But what's important is that we do need to take uh, compassionate but necessary and fair measures now because there are people who are dying to try and get here. They are breaking our laws. They are abusing the generosity of the British people. What she couldn't do is tell me uh, when uh, people will be deported, whether they will be deported to Rwanda, when that will happen, and detention centres in the meantime, when will they be built or reopened? Couldn't tell me that either. Stay tuned.